Yeah, we don't want that. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Thoburn. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Hudson Institute, and I'm very honored to be here today uh, at the Atlantic Council in conjunction with the Charles Koch Institute uh, for a really entertaining discussion, a debate that I hope we're going to have uh, about whether or not the U.S. should arm Ukraine. That's the question at hand. Should the U.S. arm Ukraine? And I wanted actually to start uh, the program today with a little bit of a poll to see just how many of you think you've made up your minds about your own answer to this question. <laughs> how many of you think you've already decided? How many of you have not yet decided and are open to being swayed? <laughs> Gentlemen, you have a very tall order at hand. <laughs> Well, for those of you watching online on C-SPAN, uh, I invite you to follow us on Twitter at the hashtag FutureUkraine. Uh, and you may be wondering, why are we covering this topic now? It's been three years, really, since we've started having this debate here in the United States about whether we should indeed arm Ukraine. And I think, you know, we, we did have that discussion a couple of years ago. But things have changed. We have a new president. The situation on the ground has changed quite significantly in Ukraine. And we now have a, a kind of push. And you're starting to see people uh, like Ambassador Kurt Volker, who's newly been named as the US representative to Ukraine negotiations, talking about the, the very real possibility of sending some kind of weaponry to Ukraine. And it's a debate that's really started to reemerge again on the policy scene. So I'm very, very glad that we have with us today two gentlemen who will be taking on the con, we should not arm Ukraine side, and two who will be arguing that we should indeed do that. Arguing for pro, Ambassador John Herbst, down there at the end, director of the Atlantic Council's uh, Eurasia Center, served for 31 years as a foreign uh, service officer in the US Department of State, and was ambassador to Ukraine as well as to Uzbekistan. Sitting next to him also arguing that the US should arm Ukraine, Ambassador Alexander Sandy Vershbow, I think most people know you as, a distinguished fellow here at the Atlantic Council, the Brent Scrowcroft Center on International Security. Uh, you may know he was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from uh, 2002 to 2016 also former uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Russian Federation, and Republic of Korea, an ex extremely distinguished career. Arguing on the con side that we should not arm Ukraine, Dr. Rajan Menon, uh, the Spitzer Chair in Political Science at the City College uh, of New York, also a senior research scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, at Columbia University and a Global Ethics Fellow at the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs and uh, has written extensively on, on these topics. And last but certainly not least, here to my immediate left is Dr. William Ruger, the Vice President for Research and Policy at the Charles Koch Institute as well as Vice President for Research. He was formerly a Research Fellow in Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, as well as an associate professor of political science uh, at Texas State University and a professor uh, at the Johnson School of Public Affairs at UT Austin. He's also currently an officer in the US Navy Reserve and a veteran of the Afghanistan War. So gentlemen, thank you very, very much for joining us all today. And uh, we're going to begin actually with the con side. I think so many times these debates always begin with the pro and then cons uh, left to be fighting from, from behind sounds a little bit more negative, I think. But we're going to start today from the con side. And the way we're going to run things is to have both of our, um, our colleagues here. We're going to start with Dr. Ruger, who will start off with five minutes of his statements, the case against arming Ukraine. Then we'll switch to Ambassador uh, Vershbow, uh, who will again give five minutes then to Dr. Manon, and then off to Ambassador Herbst. Uh, we'll then follow with rebuttals in the same order. Uh, so gentlemen, Dr. Ruger, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council for joining us uh, in sponsoring a civil debate in a period in which this has been sorely lacking in our country. And so I hope we'll hopefully we'll model good civil discourse. Now, I'll start with the case for why we should not arm Ukraine with a kind of bigger picture and then move down to the particulars uh, and hand off later to my partner, Dr. Menon. Now, sound thinking about foreign policy and the use of force always has to start with our ends. We can't look at it in a vacuum. You know, we need to be thinking about what our goals are, what are we trying to achieve, and then we can talk about the ways and means in which we need to do so, given constraints and the threat environment. And so, I think we need to make sure that we're not just looking at this vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, uh, but to our goals more generally, and how this case and what we ought to do or not do tears up to those broader goals. So I'd offer that the primary goal of our foreign policy should be to secure America's vital national interests. And foremo foremost amongst them is our safety, as well as our economic prosperity and our liberal democratic system here at home. So while we certainly want to see other societies flourish to be free and prosperous and democratic, we need to remember that the primary obligation of the US government is to the American people. And we should adopt approaches to, this, to the world with this end primarily in mind. And that requires an adult approach in which we make difficult choices about what we're going to do in the world, how we use our resources, and to really zero in on what is actually necessary for our safety as opposed to what might be desirable or ideal or tertiary. In other words, we need to think like realists. So is providing arms to Ukraine something that best meets America's interests? And we would offer a resounding no. It isn't necessary for our safety. It isn't actually productive. It's actually quite counterproductive. And it could even be bad for the Ukrainians that we're ostensibly trying to help. Therefore, we should show a little bit more humility about our ability to produce positive impacts in the world uh, as we go about our foreign policy. So let me make the brief case for why it isn't necessary and why it's counterproductive. So the United States and its allies just don't have strong interests in Ukraine. It doesn't mean there are no interests, but remember, we need to be able to look at the world as it is, not the way we would like it to be. And obviously, there are some interests that are more vital than others. So Ukraine is not a strong trading partner of the United States. In fact, it's a relatively poor country that faces great economic challenges ahead. Uh, that's why a lot of uh, Ukrainians have been emigrating. Moreover, it is not as geopolitically significant for us or our allies as its supporters would insist. Uh, the West won the Cold War and kept Europe free without Ukraine. In fact, Ukraine was on the other side during the Cold War as part of the Soviet Union. Um, and again, the Soviet Union posed a much greater threat to, Europe, to the United States and our European allies than Russia does today. And regardless of the status of Ukraine, a country that is not an ally of the United States and is not a member of NATO, something we need to remember, okay, that is not going to impact, again, regardless of that status, it's not going to impact our deterrent or defensive capability in Europe. We can defend and deter in Europe with our allies without Ukraine. And this is shown in terms of a lot of the research done by people like Daryl Press on credibility, that you don't have to put your credibility on the line in one place for it to be firm in another. The other thing is that our main interest in the region is to improve relations with Russia such that we can reduce any pressure or threats to our current allies like the Baltic states and can work better with Russia on issues of mutual interest. And this isn't to deny that the United States and Russia don't have its problems where they have competing or conflicting interests, but it's to say that there are places where the two countries could work together. Talking about counterterrorism, for example, in the Middle East, or nuclear nonproliferation when it comes to places like Iran, and then dealing with the difficult situation in North Korea. Moreover, Russia could make things difficult for the United States in various places if we get involved in a kind of tit for tat, we arm this place, they arm another place. That's not necessarily in our interests. And again, this should not be confused with appeasement. The United States should be willing to stand firm against Russia on matters that are vital to US interests, but we don't want to create trouble where we have little interests. And we also don't want a situation where the Russians can escalate 
in a case where they have escalation dominance. In other words, where they have the ability to escalate, it's in their interest, they have greater ability, and, and, and my partner here will go in more about that later. But the fact is, is that it's very difficult for us to engage in an escalation spiral where that turns out to be good for the United States. I'd also say that sending arms uh, to Ukraine is likely to be bad for the Ukrainians, or at least it won't help. Uh, so for example, the commander of the US Army in Europe, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, noted that sending anti-tank javelins and other arms, he said, quote, will not change the situation strategically in a positive way. So I think we should listen to uh, my fellow military officer. Uh, but it might be worse, uh, not just not better, but actually worse, um, again, if this situation gets escalated, or if we see the Ukrainians do what Barry Posen of MIT calls reckless driving, uh, where if that country believes that the United States or our allies is going to be firmly supportive of that country should it get into trouble, that it might actually drive recklessly and get into some trouble that it wouldn't otherwise if we didn't have that kind of, if they didn't have that sense that we might come or ride to the rescue, either with more arms or with actually uh, greater military involvement. And this is exactly what happened in Georgia in 2008, where the Georgians behaved recklessly. And again, that conflict had a lot of causes. But the fact is, is that the Georgians behaved recklessly. They were driving recklessly. And that led to a problem for the Georgians themselves. And so we need to remember that there are a lot of un unintended consequences of our foreign policy actions. And again, back to humility. We need to have greater humility about what the United States does in the world think through second order consequences, and be laser-like focused on America's safety first. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you also for keeping within that uh, five minute uh, box that we've given you. Ambassador Vershbaugh, arguing that we should arm Ukraine. Well, thanks very much. And it's good to be here this morning. I agree that we need to be clear on our goals, but we also have to be very clear on what, what is at stake here. Uh, this debate is really about whether or not we're going to let Russia get away with destroying the international rules-based order. Through its aggression against Ukraine, Russia has, as we say, torn up the international rule book, violating the UN Charter, Helsinki Final Act, and of course the Budapest Memorandum. Russia wants to go back to the days of a divided Europe when Moscow dominated its neighbors through force and coercion. And as we've seen uh, in Ukraine, uh, today's Russia is using both military force and hybrid methods to impose its will and to undermine other societies, including our own. So if the Russians aren't stopped in Ukraine, uh, they may be tempted to use the same hybrid methods uh, against our NATO allies, such as the Baltic states and Poland. And other aggressive regimes like China might be uh, emboldened to settle territorial claims by force as well. So what's at stake in Ukraine is not just Ukraine's survival as an independent democratic state, which I also think is a US interest, but, it's, but our own security and that of our allies is also at stake. In fact, the future of an international order based on the rule of law rather than the law of the jungle is very much on the line. Ukraine's armed forces, after initial uh, setbacks in 2014, have fought very courageously, uh, but at great human cost, uh, to contain the conflict in the East. And while they've benefited from limited military support and training from the US and other allies, we're not starting from scratch, the Ukrainians have been largely fighting on their own. Uh, so it's time to give them additional means to defend themselves and to level the playing field to avert a permanent sor source of tension and instability close to NATO's borders. This would not represent an escalation or lead to an escalatory spiral. Since major, major fighting ended two years, Russia has provided massive amounts of military equipment, uh, some of it of uh, re very recent uh, vintage, to the uh, separatists or, and the Russian-led forces sophisticated tanks, armored fighting vehicles, multiple launch rocket systems, electronic warfare, and, and the like. Uh, not to mention the thousands of so-called volunteers and vacationers. Uh, they've never on, uh, honored their Minsk obligations for a ceasefire and heavy weapon withdrawal. They continue to launch artillery and rocket attacks with virtual impunity just about every day, inflicting substantial military and civilian casualties. And meanwhile, the occupied territories are subject to brutal repression and becoming more and more de facto part of the Russian economy. And the substantial evidence that Russia is behind the spate of terrorist bombings inside Ukraine uh, over the last few months. Diplomatic efforts to implement Minsk remain deadlocked. And while I welcome the decision of the administration to appoint Kurt Volker as its representative for the negotiations, his prospects uh, for success remain dim. 
Uh, I think Moscow remains intent on keeping the situation at a low boil, hoping that an endless and interminable low-level conflict will eventually destabilize the rest of Ukraine, topple the government, and bring to power leaders who will abandon the Ukrainian people's uh, dream of a European future. So the challenge uh, is how to change President Putin's calculus and to convince him to negotiate in good faith uh, on implementing Minsk and getting out of the Donbass. Congress has provided some of the needed leverage with the sanctions bill, but uh, sanctions alone uh, don't seem to be enough. We need additional pressure on Putin to convince him that prolonging the conflict will only bring increased costs for Russia, that time is not on his side. And the best way to do that is to significantly expand U.S. security assistance, and in particular to lift the Obama administration's embargo on lethal defensive weapons. But let me stress, the aim is not to encourage Ukraine to seek a military victory, and I think Kiev knows that that's impossible. Rather, the purpose of providing defensive weapons is to help Ukraine protect its forces, reduce casualties, deter the Russians from carrying out further attacks by raising the costs of further aggression, and ultimately to increase the pressure on Russia to negotiate seriously on implementing Minsk. A lot of what the Ukrainians need isn't technically lethal, such as more advanced counter-battery radars, armored vehicles, reconnaissance drones, and secure communications. The most controversial item that's uh, under consideration, uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, wouldn't increase the Ukrainians' potential to recapture territory. Uh, but they would help deter new Russian large-scale offensives by creating a greater risk of significant equipment losses and casualties. And I think that uh, there's a lot of evidence that casualties are a sensitive issue for Putin, who still pretends that there are no Russians in the Donbass, uh, and punishes those who speak publicly of casualties. Now, will this be enough to alter Putin's calculus? There's no guarantee, but I think it will make a difference. Uh, and I think it's no coincidence that Putin suddenly offered this peacekeeping proposal a few weeks ago, just after Secretary of Defense Mattis was talking about lethal defensive weapons uh, on his visit to uh, Ukraine in late August. He may, Putin may be looking for a diplomatic way out. But even if increasing uh, security assistance doesn't, doesn't change Putin's calculus in the short term, it will make it harder for him to destabilize Ukraine, and it will serve as a warning that aggression elsewhere would meet a stronger Western response. And it will create the foundation of strength and commitment to our values that will ultimately make it easier to get back to a cooperative relationship with Russia than by demonstrating weakness and lack of resolve when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vershbaugh. We're now going to turn uh, to Dr. Menon for your thoughts on why we should not arm Ukraine. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this event, not least because the Council has taken a very clear position on this. Certainly my two, uh, I wouldn't call them not opponents. Not, not my, as an institution. My two colleagues. <laughs> well, it's a matter of opinion. Um, I want to make sure that it's understood that those who oppose Ukraine are not people who are not decrying the Russian annexation of Crimea and the fomenting of an insurgency or separatist movement, call it what you will, in eastern Ukraine. But as I understand the case, certainly as made yesterday and in the publications of my two colleagues and others who favor arming Ukraine, it is that putting pressure on Vladimir Putin by supplying these arms will make him realize that the war cannot be won the Ukrainian government cannot be toppled, and he will be amenable to some kind of political deal, and that the ultimate goal is a political deal. Now, that is certainly one possibility. I'm not a soothsayer, so I don't know. But what about another possibility? If you look at the distance from the United States to the Donbass, it's about 6,000 miles. If you look at the distance from Poland, which has a border with Ukraine, to the Donbass, it's about 700 miles. Russia has a 1,165, give or take, border with Ukraine. On the other side are thousands of Russian troops and constant military bases. So think about this, because we need to think carefully before we take the first step. Why would the reaction of Vladimir Putin, because he has reacted as such in, on prior occasions, in the Baltsova, in Ilovesk, and of Azovsk in 2014-15, why would it not be to scale up what he can do very easily, which is to reinforce the separatists? Now then, there's a quandary. What does the United States do having put made in USA weapons in the hands of the Ukrainians? One, of course, is to say, well, we can't allow them to 
fall because it's just been said that this is an issue of paramount importance. So we scale up and develop, d uh, deliver more weapons, noting the geographical asymmetry. Yeah, that's one possibility. The second is to intervene in some direct way ourselves, although the proponents of arming have said no American boots on the ground because they know that that would be a non-starter if they didn't say that. The third possibility is to back down. I would submit to you that none of those possibilities, especially the last one, who are interested in the credibility of NATO and American credibility, would be a very good one. Let's be clear, Vladimir Putin has weathered sanctions, political isolation, put his soldiers on the ground and allowed them to die in this cause. It is true, as John has pointed out before, that the war is not popular in Russia. There's some mumbling and so on. But Putin's approval ratings are very high. And even if there's opposition, he has shown not a whit. There's not been a whit of evidence that he is willing to back down. We have to be humble when we predict the follow-on consequences of our military ventures. Let me run you through some examples where he, we have spectacularly failed in anticipating the reaction of the adversary. Vietnam, Kosovo, very, in different, very, very different ways. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. So when I hear esteemed colleagues saying, we know how this is going to play out in a teleological sense, I'm tempted to reach my wallet because I'm deeply skeptical based on our past record. There is a kind of American hubris that we seem to know. The other point I'd like to make is that Ukraine is a fairly substantial military power. One minute, wow. It has a military force uh, that's gone from 5,000 to about 250,000. Defense spending has doubled to about 64 uh, billion hryvnia now. Uh, Ukrabronprom, the state uh, manufacturer of weapons, manufactures a whole host of things. The T-84 tank, the 225 and 225 airlifter, aerial refueling tanks, um, and anti-tank guided missiles, the Stugna and the Corsair, the latter being a man pad. So it's not clear to me that this is necessary and that given that this is not a tank and mechanized infantry war, but a war in which each side is lobbing artillery shells and, and grenades uh, launchers back and forth, and even tanks that are there are now stationary, what is the target for the javelins? And by the way, if the Ukrainians have been so desperate for anti-tank guided weapons, why not use their own or use cheaper systems such as the Spike from Israel or the MMP from, uh, from France? So I have a stop sign in my face. I will stop. <laughs> and I thank you very much for paying attention to those signs. And thank you very much for uh, keeping our, our, our panelists on, on track today. Uh, you heard Dr. Manon mention uh, yesterday uh, we also did a version of this debate <coughs> on Capitol Hill yesterday, so our interlocutors here have become very familiar with each other's arguments, which I hope means that we'll get a, a bit more of a rollicking debate going as, just as soon as we move into uh, the, the more argumentative bit. Until then, Ambassador Herbst is going to close it out for the pro side. Okay. Um, I'd also like to thank the Koch Foundation for joining us in this and Will and Raj for being part of it. Uh, I think the, I agree with Will that we need to understand the importance of any issue before we choose a policy course. But I disagree that the notion that Ukraine is not, the fight in Ukraine is not a vital interest of the United States. And let me explain why. Um, we have an absolutely critical interest in maintaining the post-World War II post-Cold War security order, which was established in Europe, actually in 1945, an order based upon the sanctity of borders, uh, sovereign states, the resolution of disputes peacefully. That order, following the most destructive war in human history, World War II, has given us an absolutely unprecedented in history 75 years or 70 plus years of stability and prosperity. In 1945, only 10% of the world's population was not living in poverty. Today, it's 90% is not living in poverty, only 10% living in poverty today. No major wars 
between major powers. Despite all the failures of policies, including many failures of American policy, which, which Raj laid out in his presentation. Maintaining this is critical for our security and for our well-being. And the problem, it's very simple. We have the world's second greatest military power marauding in Europe. The Kremlin does not hide its intentions. It wants, quote, a new world order or world disorder. New rules or no rules. It wants to weaken NATO. It wants to weaken the EU. It wants to establish a sphere of influence at a minimum in the post-Soviet space, but probably beyond that. And to achieve these objectives, the Kremlin conducted a war against Georgia, changed borders in Georgia, seized Crimea, and is continuing an ongoing, not so covert, hybrid war in Donbass. Now, we need to stop this before Moscow stumbles into some provocation in the Baltic states, NATO allies, where we have a firm commitment to intervene, to defend them. The forward defense of NATO, the forward defense of our interests, demands that we give Mr. Putin, or we help Mr. Putin have a hard time in Donbass. Will argued that if we are nice to the Kremlin on Ukraine, we will be able to help ease pressure on the Baltic states. I couldn't disagree more on that. We tried the nice guy approach after Georgia with a very weak response. We got Crimea. We tried the nice guy approach with a very weak response after Crimea. We got Donbass. Thank goodness our leaders began to wise up, albeit not as quickly as we might like. So the response, once the covert campaign began in Donbass, was better. We got real sanctions, though it took several months to get it. And it took, in fact, for the Europeans to act, the shoot down of the um, airliner, the Malaysian airliner. Uh, as Sandy pointed out, uh, the Kremlin has two vulnerabilities here. One is the isolation and the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy. The other is the fact that the Russian people do not want to be fighting in, the Dunbas, in Donbass. So providing weapons to increase Russian casualties will make Mr. Putin more cautious. Does that mean I have one minute left? OK, thank you. Uh, I agree with Raj that American inability to anticipate the future has been a serious problem in our foreign policy. I don't think it's a problem here. We are not arguing that if we give weapons to Ukraine, this will for sure deter Mr. Putin from additional aggression in Ukraine. It might not. But it will certainly raise the cost of that aggression. It will, make it, it, may, it will mean he has fewer resources to conduct provocations and aggression against our Baltic allies. And it means the West will respond stronger if he escalates. One final point before my time runs out. No doubt, Russia seems to have a greater interest in Ukraine, per se, than the United States. But it doesn't have nearly as great an interest in Ukraine as the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainian people are fighting for their territorial integrity and their sovereignty. The Russian people want no part of that fight. Giving Ukrainian weapons to do this will discourage Moscow and lead to a better outcome an outcome consistent with our most basic interests. Thanks very much, Ambassador Herbst. We're now going to move into a period of three-minute rebuttals going in the same order uh, that, that each of our speakers initially spoke. So we will start again with you, Dr. Ruger, a three-minute rebuttal. Yeah, so I, I think the ambassador has shown, uh, I think, a good deal of humility by saying, you know, we don't know if this is going to work. Um, I guess what I would bring to the table here on that is, OK, then what next? And do we get into that kind of spiral model of escalation on one side, escalation on another? It just ramps up and up. And at what point do we, given that we have fewer interests than both Ukraine and Russia, do we have to then say no mas? And what does that mean for the vaunted credibility that the advocates of doing something keep talking about. So I'd be worried about that. Now again, the other thing is that if it really is a matter uh, as dire as the entire rule-based order of the international system is under siege, uh, 
then I think there might be people that flank you to the hawkish side who might say, well, we really need to do even more. Uh, that means that we actually need to, to get more deeply entrenched in this conflict uh, because otherwise this is going to lead to the end of the Westphalian system. Um, and I think that, A, maybe the cat's out of the bag already on that, uh, but the fact is, is that um, we are going to be uh, drawn into something that might even seem crazy to us now if we allow this escalation to continue. And I would say that we just need to be very clear about what our interests are, what we need to do or not do, and basically be sober about what could occur and what might be next. Uh, so that's, I think, the most important thing. The other thing is that um, when we talk about uh, you know, some of the lessons of history here, uh, there are a lot of dueling lessons, a lot of dueling uh, case studies. And uh, yesterday uh, we talked about the issue of, is this like World War I, right, if we don't do something? Well, I would claim that if we do do something, that's actually more of a danger when you're talking about getting engaged in a peripheral area that actually harms kind of core interests. And I think that has to be a worry in any scenario. So to me, uh, the lesson here would be, be very clear about what you need to do. Don't do what you, 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 that is not in our interests or isn't necessary, uh, because then you might get tugged and dragged into something beyond which you really want to engage. Ambassador Rushbell. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm not a soothsay soothsayer either, and uh, you know, we, no one can guarantee they, that a particular course of action will lead to one specific outcome. But uh, I think it's highly unlikely that the Russians would respond to the kind of assistance that is being debated here uh, by escalating massively. And first of all, their ambitions, I think, have been scaled back because the Ukrainians have been fairly effective after the initial setbacks when they you know, couldn't get their act together and were you know, reeling by the, by the surprise that their former fraternal neighbor was trying to dismember their country. That wasn't supposed to be part of the, uh, the Slavic Brotherhood. Uh, but the Ukrainians fought to a stalemate. They recovered some of the towns uh, because the Russians were trying to keep this ambiguous so they didn't initially put in the whole Russian army. But uh, only by doing so were they able to force the, uh, the, the stalemate that's reflected in the Minsk agreements. Uh, but they've had to give up their fantasy of this Novo Russia in which uh, different parts of southern and southeastern Ukraine would fall like dominoes into their laps because of pro-Russian sentiment. It turns out the Ukrainians, as John was suggesting, uh, love their country and are ready to fight for it, uh, even if they speak Russian as their first language, even if, some, if they're ethnically Russian by their own self-identification. And so uh, Putin, I think, knows that Escalating this conflict would require a much more massive commitment to force, uh, to conquer more territory, to garrison it, to occupy it, probably face a guerrilla resistance. Uh, I don't think he's, he's likely to go there. Uh, and I think the Russian people would object to that. You know, they have been taken in by the propaganda, but if they knew that the Ru Russians would be sending off in large numbers to fight other Slavs, Slavic brothers, uh, they, they would not uh, go for it. So I think ultimately what we're suggesting has the potential to change Putin's calculus in the other direction. That may not be enough, uh, but the assistance that, that was provided under the Obama administration didn't cause the Russians to freak out and escalate. Uh, they've absorbed it. Uh, it includes some pretty effective technologies, but it hasn't been enough, I think, to stand by the Ukrainians and help them reduce their losses, hold the Russians more at risk, and, uh, and deter the Russians definitively from uh, launching further aggression. And in a sense, Ukraine is, uh, is, you know, is fighting a battle that's ultimately in, uh, for our benefit. What's happening in the Donbas, you could say, is the eastern frontier of democratic Europe, and the Ukrainians are fighting for, for our values, for our principles. We've stood by them this long. We've maintained the sanctions. To suddenly pull back at this stage, I think, would be seen as a, a major uh, betrayal of, uh, of, of our own values. And, uh, it would be perhaps seen as a green light by Russia to even engage in more subversion and uh, efforts to topple the regime through other means. So I think uh, uh, we owe it to the Ukrainians to continue to stand by them, but they're fighting their own battles. They can get weapons from other sources. They do manufacture anti-tank weapons. In fact, Poroshenko said yesterday after his meeting with President Trump, we didn't talk about anti-tank weapons because we have our own. Uh, but I think there are technologies that they would benefit from, and now's the time to provide them.
Thank you very much. Dr. Menon. Well, where to begin? First, <laughs> I'd like to thank John for helping make my case for me because he listed a litany of things that Vladimir Putin did that took him and everyone by surprise. Didn't mention Syria. So betting that he is going to play by your rule book, I, I think is absolutely not a valid thing to do given the stakes here. This came up in yesterday's discussion. NATO's future is at stake. The transatlantic alliance is at stake. I, I, I'm sorry, that just amounts to heavy breathing. And if you have problems within NATO, there's a lot that NATO can and should do. Scaling up defense spending, ending duplication that they have not done. A wealthy continent, uh, continent has gotten used to an American security guarantee. And now we should get involved in a fight on Russia's border to reassure them of our credibility. The logic of that just flummoxes me completely. Um, Poroshenko being toppled. Well, the Russians may like to see Poroshenko gone, but Mr. Poroshenko has bigger problems. He has an approval rating of 22%, and every single institution in Ukraine, including the Anti-Corruption Bureau, has an, uh, about a single digit um, approval rating. Notwithstanding, the Ukrainian economy has started growing, the uh, debt is down, and inflation is down. What will the Ukrainians do with the weapons? My two colleagues say, well, you know, they know that they know, uh, they're not going to take the Donbass back. That's not their aim. Mr. Poroshenko said just a few days ago to the U.S. Military Academy that his objective was precisely to take the Donbass back. So it doesn't matter what we here in Washington think. It's what Ukraine thinks that, uh, that matters. Principles of international order and how Russia has wrecked them. Now, please, yes, they've done some things that are just absolutely not kosher. But let us look honestly and ask ourselves, have we been always faithful to these uh, principles? A preventive war in Iraq without any reason, an intervention on humanitarian grounds in Kosovo, simply saying the UN can get lost, rendition, torture, opting out of the climate agreement, the ICC. So if we're going to blame the Russians, and they ought to be blamed for a lot of things, let us be fair. We haven't exactly been the paragons of the international order as, uh, as well. So I would say the main thing boils down to this. Mr. Putin now has put forward a peace agreement. Ambassador Vershpa has written a very good piece on this, showing that it has very significant ambiguities and holes. That is true. It is not acceptable in its present form. This may be a time, however, to negotiate that. I think the effect of arming Ukraine now will, be not, will not be salutary on the diplomatic process. Because the calculation is Putin's put forward this, this proposal, and we want to put pressure on him to give us a better deal. The opposite could also be true. He might calculate, well, I want to ramp up my negotiating position by scaling up very easily, and I can do that. And in terms of the popularity of the war, unpopularity in Russia, may or may not be. That's not a big issue for him. I don't think the state is threatened by this particular war and its domestic unpopularity. It's got other problems coming down the road. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Herbst, the last word is yours. Um, an argument made against arming Ukraine is this would lead to an escalation spiral, which might cause the United States to consider actually intervening with troops in Ukraine. Um, our position is very clear. Uh, the purpose of providing weapons to Ukraine is, one, to deter further Russian aggression. But two, if there is further Russian aggression, to increase the cost to Moscow so as few resources with which to threaten other countries. Uh, that is it. And properly, prop, a proper policy, which heads in this direction, provides no risk of America sending troops to Ukraine. So that's point one. Point two, uh, the argument made that NATO's future is not at stake in Ukraine. It's certainly true that NATO could defend itself without reference to Ukraine. But the smart policy is to defend yourself at minimal cost. And since there's a war going on in Donbass, make the Russians pay there so you don't have to fight them in Estonia or in Latvia. Uh, three, regarding the Russian threat to the international order. There's no question that American foreign policy over the past 15 years has not been skillful. There's no question that there have been mistakes which do cut against the international order. But it's also true that American policy in making those mistakes were not driven by the conscious effort 
to undermine that order, which is what Kremlin policy is. It's significant that our distinguished colleagues here have not addressed Russian revisionism in doctrine and on the ground. Uh, the notion that there is a contradiction between providing arms to Ukraine and pursuing diplomacy is simply wrong. Again, we tried a soft approach. Uh, I'll, I'll not use the, the phrase appeasement, though I think that may apply here. We applied that, we applied that soft approach after the Russians carved up Georgia. And we achieved nothing. Instead of that making the Russians more sympathetic to our friends in the region, it, it prompted them to seize, or permitted them to seize Crimea. We tried the same approach with Crimea. And what we got was a war in Donbass. It's time we learned from our mistakes. It's time we toughened up. That will enable us to maintain our NATO allies with minimal effort, well, excuse me, not minimal effort, but with less effort, with less danger of bloodshed, with less danger of American intervening to protect our Baltic allies, or the Poles for that matter, or Romania. This is the smart play with a risk we can manage. Thank you very much, Ambassador Herbst, and my thanks to all four of you for raising, I think, a, a very uh, full set of issues surrounding this question. But I, I'm a little interested to notice that none of the four of you mentioned something that is very often brought up in Ukrainian uh, requests for this kind of assistance, and that's the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. And the argument often goes that the United States, Russia, UK, Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum in order to have a kind of security assurance in exchange for Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons. So I'd be very curious to hear from both the pro and con side how you react to that um, assertion, particularly from the Ukrainian side. And we'll begin with Khan. Yeah, so I'll just use uh, another esteemed member of the foreign policy establishment to make our case for us, which is Strobe Talbot, now president of Brookings, uh, who was the deputy secretary of state who led the negotiations on the memorandum you're talking about. And he said, quote, this does not mean the U.S. is willing to come to the defense of Ukraine if it is attacked militarily. So there isn't a kind of guarantee um, of, of any type of provision of defense. In fact, uh, uh, people as, uh, as wide and far as uh, Evo Dalger to Mike O'Hanlon have said that uh, even the NATO uh, Article 5 guarantee is not a guarantee of anything in particular. You could send a sternly worded note uh, as a response. Uh, so the kind of commitments that we've actually made are, are inflated as much as, uh, as the threats are in this community. Pro? It's, uh, I, I mentioned briefly the Budapest Memorandum, and indeed uh, it doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. It was not a hard security guarantee, much to the Ukrainians' uh, regret. I think they feel that they were swindled in giving up uh, it was either the third or the fourth largest nuclear arsenal uh, for guarantees of their sovereignty and territorial integrity, which was submitted to the Secretary General of the UN on, on a signature by Sergei Lavrov when he was ambassador. Uh, and now he says, what Budapest memorandum? Uh, we didn't sign it with this regime. But, you know, international agreements tra transfer from one government to the next. Uh, I, we don't have a legal obligation under the Budapest memorandum, but I think it gives us a, at least a moral obligation to do what we can to help Ukraine uh, restore its sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, by supporting them politically, by providing uh, economic and political support, by maintaining the united front with Europe on the sanctions, but also by giving them uh, defensive weapons so that they can uh, prevent further territorial acquisitions by, uh, by the Russians and their, and their proxies in eastern Ukraine. Uh, there's also issues relating to the, you know, the viability of the international nonproliferation regime, which we're seeing uh, uh, today with North Korea, which can point to Ukraine's folly of giving up its nukes as, a, as, as one of the justifications for keeping their own. Uh, but largely, it's uh, about you know, the, the rules of the game in Europe and the respect for the sovereign, uh, sovereignty of borders, territorial integrity of, of independent states, which Russia has flagrantly violated. And I think it, it should give us more uh, motivation to, to help the Ukrainians and, and to point things towards a diplomatic solution. Uh, that, you know, that's what I see as the ultimate goal of all this, not 
to escalate the conflict, but to bring about a diplomatic solution. Any additions? Anna, your question was narrowly on the Budapest Memorandum. Did the Russians violate the Budapest Memorandum? Of course, there's just no question about that. I'm not here to litigate that. That was about as egregious as the so-called bogus referendum that they conducted in Crimea. That also was a flagrant violation. That's not the issue. The issue is really whether the Budapest Memorandum obliges us to take a step which Will and I think is extremely foolish and extremely dangerous. It does not. No reading of the Budapest Memorandum could lead you to the conclusion that we therefore have an obligation. We can talk about moral obligations, but I think that morality, as much as I like it, I like it as much as the next man, has to be filtered through concrete circumstances, not simply used automatically as a guide uh, for action. So on, on the Budapest Memorandum, the answer is it was a violation, but it obliges us to do no such thing as what's being proposed here. Ambassador Herbst? Uh, I would just make the point that sometimes lawyers and statesmen who use them are too clever. There's no question that the Budapest Memorandum did not guarantee Ukraine security. The United States gave not guarantees to Ukraine, but assurances. And this is one of those cases where the guarantee, guarantees versus assurances is the fine print. So the fact that Moscow invaded Ukraine against US assurances and assurances of other countries, in fact, was a mark against American credibility. That's point one. Point two is the one that Sandy made, but just, just to emphasize it a little bit. I think it's safe to say that the greatest example of counterproliferation was the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the very weak reaction coming from the United States, France, and Britain. In other words, this was a marker to rogue regimes. Do, don't give up your weapons of mass destruction because look what happens to you when you do that. Of course, we repeated that mistake in Libya. Again, America's made a lot of mistakes over the past 15 years. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Uh, one of you in, in your statements mentioned this new peacekeeping proposal that has emerged. Uh, Ukrainians have talked about it for some time. Uh, President Putin of Russia has also discussed. Uh, and this is the, the sort of idea of placing UN peacekeepers or some sort of a UN body uh, inside Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians would like for those peacekeepers to be throughout the uh, so-called LNR and DNR, the occupied areas in eastern Ukraine, whereas the Russian proposal uh, in, would rather have them on the contact line. And I believe uh, President Putin's words were to protect the OSCE special monitoring mission rather than be peacekeepers on their own. Now that we're starting to see some willingness or some interest from the side of Russia in moving forward, on a kind of conclusion or s some small steps towards changing the situation in eastern Ukraine. What, in your opinion, so on both sides, what would the United States' giving of weaponry, whether that be radar and night vision goggles, uh, be that javelin anti-tank missiles or things that are a bit more lethal, what impact do you see any U.S. provision of arms or military uh, equipment to the Ukrainians having on this nascent uh, idea for a peacekeeping proposal in eastern Ukraine? So begin with the con. So Hannah, in addition to the flaws in the proposal that you mentioned, and I'm sure Sandy will have more to say about this, there's a six-month um, time limit that they've stipulated now, both Putin and Lavrov. There is also the question of monitoring of the Russian-Ukrainian frontier. Will the, the troops and volunteers, what have you, wh whatever you call them, once they leave, will they come back and how will we make sure? So in its present form, it's not ideal. Now, what will be the effect, and this is the brunt of your question, on providing arms to Ukraine if this diplomatic process gets going? Now, Sandy could be right. One possibility could be that Putin will say, oh my gosh, the Americans are giving the arms to the Ukrainians, so I better settle up here. Certainly. But that's not the only possibility. The only possibility, the other possibility is a scale up. And from what we've seen in the long history of Vladimir Putin's behavior, and given the circumstances at play, I would put my money on the other. I'm not saying that Sandy is wrong, because it is a plausible argument. I'm just saying it's not the only argument, and we ought to really think about whether, in fact, we could take a diplomatic 
uh, opportunity and blow it out of the water? I think that, uh, first of all, there, there's reasons to be skeptical about the proposal itself, but nevertheless, we should be uh, testing uh, Putin uh, in the negotiating uh, room, uh, and that's what I suggested in this uh, piece I wrote for The Hill the, uh, the other day. Uh, but I think uh, Putin definitely is a man who feels you have to negotiate from a position of strength, and I think that's the way we should enter the, to this, into this discussion as well. I mean, we don't have to sort of send 15 plane loads of weapons uh, tomorrow morning in order to increase our, our negotiating leverage. But I think maintaining the ongoing uh, momentum in terms of the uh, cooperation with the Ukrainians, which was apparently something was discussed between Trump and, and uh, Poroshenko yesterday about expanding defense cooperation, uh, continue to show that we're standing by the Ukrainians, that uh, there may be further uh, more uh, capable bits of hardware in the pipeline, I think that will contribute to uh, Putin's seriousness in this negotiation. Uh, but the main thing is to test whether he's interested in a real peacekeeping force as opposed to the, uh, the, the concept that he's put on the table, which, as R Rajan said, would uh, be very limited in its scope, mainly protecting the OSC monitors and the geographic location, primarily on the line of contact, would basically turn that line into a de facto international border and lead to the freezing of the conflict. What's the sine qua non, and this is what Poroshenko has been talking about in the last couple of days, is uh, ha having access to the whole territory of the, of the occupied Donbass, uh, including the international border, so that it could become a force that would uh, oversee the actual implementation of, of Minsk, withdrawal of heavy weapons, of illegal militias. Some of the, you know, the Russians say they're not there, but let's just hope they would disappear into Russia and never come back, and the UN force would be on the border to, uh, to make sure that uh, they don't come back. So uh, I, I'm not particularly optimistic that yes, Putin intended this as anything more than a distraction because of what Matt has said about defensive weapons. But uh, let's, uh, let's see. I certainly hope that we could achieve a breakthrough, and uh, then our debate would be uh, not entirely academic, but more academic if the war was actually coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ruger. Yeah, and again, I'll highlight what uh, my partner said, which is we're not opposed to diplomatic efforts to resolve this conflict in a way that is uh, you know, better for Ukraine, better for peace in, in Europe, and better for the United States. What we want to do is make sure that we're not uh, doing something that could encourage us going backwards rather than forwards in those diplomatic efforts. Uh, we don't want to encourage militarized revanchism on the part of Ukraine, for example. Uh, we want to allow for diplomacy and the other levers of power that the United States and others are using to work themselves out towards a resolution of this problem. So uh, again, we're, we're not saying that we don't want to do anything. It's that we want to make sure that we're choosing our means carefully and we calibrate those towards the ends and we think through what next. Ambassador Herbst, any additions? Uh, the peacekeeping proposal might represent Russian flexibility. Uh, we'll find out um, in the weeks, weeks to come. But, and you can't rule out that providing um, additional limited equipment to Ukraine um, might provoke Kremlin, Kremlin escalation. But what we've seen again is continuing Russian escalation in the absence of such counter, counter force. Again, weak reaction to the Georgian aggression gets Crimea, weak reaction to Crimea gets Donbass. Um, we've seen Putin regularly maneuver starting in the fall of 2014 in response to Western sanctions, maneuver in ways to suggest he was not escalating to avoid further sanctions. And I think we've seen, as Sandy suggested, as we talk about Americans providing def lethal defensive weapons, um, some maneuvering in terms of this initiative. Soft approach has failed. Um, it's time to try something better. Thank you. And my thanks to all of you. We're now going to open up the floor to all of you uh, for questions to our distinguished panel. Uh, I will, you, you, we encourage you to ask a question to one side or the other, or to both uh, at the same time. Uh, but please, when you're recognized uh, and the microphone is handed to you, please introduce yourself and ask a question that ends with a question mark. Uh, <laughs> Matt Rojansky back there in the back. It's on its way. It's nice when you know the name. 
<laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Matt Rojanski from the Kennan Institute. So uh, I, I'm going to direct the first part of the question to both sides. Um, I'm, I am a little lost in the decision trees, the multiple possibilities. Can you give me your best sense if on Monday the United States were to answer this proposal and send the weapons, what is the most likely Russian response you believe on Tuesday? I mean, I mean that metaphorically, both sides. And the second question, this is in particular for the pro side, if Raj is right that there is a considerable possibility that the Russians exert this escalation dominance and that the United States can't match it and our prestige is at stake, et cetera, et cetera, why not take the approach that he implied, I, I don't think you got to develop the idea, of supplying substantively the same capability, just not doing it directly. Th this particular proposal, if I may, the sort of 50 or 100 or whatever it is, appears to be a made-for-TV proposal, right? It's so sort of perfect and compact that it can be debated ad infinitum, <laughs> you know, in the American version. Why not do it the way we've done it, you know, many, many times before through third parties, et cetera? Excellent question. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, we'll start with, again with the con side okay. uh, on, on the first gen more general question. Second one was to us? Yes. Yeah, okay. But the first one also to you as well. Yeah. So who starts? Uh, the con side oh, will begin. Mm -hmm. What will Putin's reaction be? Now, as someone who's tried to make the case here that we ought to be humble about how we predict reactions, I'll say I don't know. But I don't think he's going to be starting to scale up the war all of a sudden. There are many reasons why he wouldn't want to do that, because he wants a kind of rapprochement, I think, with the West, because the sanctions have hurt Russia. There's no question. But I think he'll wait and see what is done with the weapons and what, gra what, what difference it makes materially on the ground. He will not allow the Donbas separatists to be defeated. He cannot afford to do that. Rather than do that, he will scale up. So I, will, I would say that Lavrov and um, Putin, probably Mr. Lavrov, will give in a stentorian voice condemnation of the proposal very eloquently. They'll wait and see. I don't think they'll immediately withdraw their proposal for peacekeeping. Peacekeeping proposal is very interesting, by the way. Soon after this crisis broke, I and a few colleagues met with Russian scholars for an off the cuff, unofficial discussion on how to politically resolve this question. The Putin proposal that we're kind of tentatively welcoming now bears a very strong resemblance to some of the ideas that were suggested at that meeting. What happened? We came back to find a McCarthyist manifesto denouncing us, signed by all manner of people, arguing that we had negotiated on behalf of the Ukrainian government. That's absurd. I'm an academic. I don't negotiate on behalf of countries. But I'm glad to see that this diplomatic thing is on track. I think the diplomatic solution is the only solution. I think the gravest threat to Ukraine, apart from the military threat, is whether the uh, reforms will go forward in a robust and significant way. And there are people like Anders here who can speak to that. So Matt, that's your answer with a little bit of my own time to act on. Uh, the pro side on what Putin will do on Tuesday if we arm on Monday. I think a lot depends on what's in the, in the, in the package or what's in the plane that's delivering this weapon. Uh, but I, I actually think if, if we did, for example, all the recommendations that are in this uh, task force report that we, John and I, worked on with the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, uh, most of these things are uh, kind of more advanced versions of things that they've received before, like more advanced and longer range counter battery radars, tactical secure communications, UAVs, armored fighting vehicles, more intelligence sharing, uh, combined with lots more training for their forces, which is going on on a pretty significant scale already. Uh, I think that Putin would, would rant and rave in the propaganda arena, but uh, I don't think there would be uh, a significant escalation uh, on, on, the, on the ground. Uh, no one can guarantee this. I could be wrong. But uh, I think that uh, it would more likely have a salutary effect on his willingness uh, to negotiate. Uh, the second question is an interesting one uh, about why not provide it indirectly, either third party acquisition in the open or even covertly. Uh, uh, that is an option. It, it might uh, have advantages in terms of uh, plausible deniability. Uh, if you know, the Russians are good at that game, we can play that game too. Uh, might also uh, make it less likely. John made this point yesterday. I think it was persuasive that uh, the Russians may have less uh, sense of immediacy of, of a need to respond if 
they can't uh, point to some you know, White House press release uh, declaring what we're doing. Uh, but I personally sort of feel we should be transparent about this uh, because it's in our interest. I think it's justified. Um, and that would be a continuation of a commitment to Ukraine that has been very strong since the aggression of 2014, and it's been strong since independence in 1991. So I don't think we have to be uh, secretive about it, but, uh, but it is an option. To the con side, to, to follow on the second part of Matt's question, would you be as opposed to the United States using a second or third party to deliver? Part of the argument that the pro side is making is that this will reassure our allies that we have to, you know, Ukraine is a, uh, is, is a key uh, credibility signal for our actual allies. Um, covert loses some of that reassurance, and so it, it's not as helpful. Um, so if I were on the pro side, I, I wouldn't want it to be covert. As, uh, it just loses a lot of its value. I, as Sandy mentioned, strongly support, and of course it's crazy to be saying this with <laughs> television cameras on, I strongly support providing this weaponry to Ukraine covertly. <laughs> For the f <laughs> <laughs> and you'll put that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> for the following reason. Um, Will is right that doing it that way diminishes some of the reassurance value, but only some. Increase the price from him on his, his intervention. And two, to help show him a reasonable way out. Now, if we go in there beating our chest and say, look at this, we provide these weapons, the Russians are toast, that would, provide, that would give them incentive to react badly, as we would see it. But if we do this, it's his, it's his decision whether to make this an issue. And we've seen him demonstrate a certain level of nuance back when the Turks shot down the Russian jets after their fourth incursion into their airspace. Uh, the Minister of Defense, Shoigu, and the Presidential spokes spokesman, Peskov, both said, we don't know if the Turks shot it down. Maybe the Turkmen in Syria. Then Erdogan, for reasons that I can imagine, but I don't think were wise, chose to beat his chest and say, hey, yeah, we did it. And that forced the Russian reaction. There's no question that Moscow is paying a heavy price for its invasion of Ukraine, that they didn't expect the resistance they faced, both in Ukraine and internationally, even though the resistance internationally has not been strong enough to my taste. And there are certainly people in Moscow who understand they need to change course. And we just want to help them make that right decision a little bit faster. All right, we'll move on uh, to the next uh, questions. Uh, gentleman in the uh, pink and navy striped tie there. Microphone should be on this way. Thank you. Uh, great debate. Thank you very much, uh, Mike Pazner, U.S. Senate staff. Um, two quick questions. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the economic uh, repercussions of this, because clearly, lifting of the sanctions has been a priority for Mr. Putin's government, and they clearly have hurt. And I think, uh, as Ambassador Herbst mentioned, uh, uh, probably uh, the uh, willingness of some of our European partners to enforce and to continue those ad infinitum has been flagging. Um, so the provision of defensive weapons, should there be an escalation, could uh, thereby increase the uh, willingness of Europe to maintain and may possibly even increase those sanctions against uh, further Russian aggression. On the other hand, uh, we've also seen that the Russian economy has uh, so far weathered uh, the, the sanctions that we do have in place that they, uh, I think the menus in Moscow I've read now proudly uh, uh, indicate that shrimp are coming from the Russian Far East and they've been able to substitute uh, and, and even to s in some cases uh, uh, stimulate the local economy to weather those sanctions. Um, and of course, uh, the regime benefits from conflict and perceived conflict with the West as a means of staying in power. So what is the economic benefit or detriment to the regime, uh, 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 the, the benefit or detriment of the economic aspects of this? And finally, I just add the second quick question is, uh, New York Times ran uh, an obit uh, earlier this week of um, the uh, Soviet lieutenant colonel who prevented uh, World War III in 1983. Uh, obviously, that seems more far-fetched now, but is it becoming less so <laughs> as the risk factor in Moscow clearly has gone way down from uh, 
the Soviet regime and possibly uh, the Rus calculus here is heading the same way. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to start with the con side again. I'll just add one thing and then hand off, which is uh, your mentioning of the Sorry? fact you that go first on the prior Soviet Union and now Russia is a nuclear power, I think should give us a lot of sobriety about how we deal with this issue. We just need to remember that, uh, that our major interest is to avoid the type of problems from a nuclearized or a nuclear Russia. Uh, and that's the most critical thing we need to keep in context. Nice tie, by the way. I like it a lot. <laughs> um, have the sanctions hurt the Russian economy? Absolutely. Which is why Mr. Putin wants them lifted. The biggest mistake he made, in my view, in beginning this um, insurgency and annexing uh, Crimea was he thought that the sanctions would not be kept in place by a motley crew of 36 countries. That was a big strategic mistake. The United States and Europe have stayed together on this. On the other hand, at the risk of being academic, which profession I plead guilty to belonging to, <laughs> uh, there, is a large, um, th there, there is a large literature on sanctions done with a lot of empirical data. And I'll sum up the, 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 the finding of the, of the majority. It is that the higher the stakes, the greater the sunk costs, the less likely that economic sanctions will work. In the United States, there's a, uh, there's a predisposition to think of, of, of international politics as homo economicus. States will go to war and do all manner of dastardly things for things that, have, that defy all economic logic. And I don't think they're motivated simply by economics. Now, I, I didn't understand the last part of your question, but it, it was something like, what effect will this have on the European allies in terms of uh, arms? It's interesting to note, isn't it, that in this town, there is a huge campaign to arm the Ukrainians. There is no analog in a single NATO country. In fact, there are polls show that the public is not generally in favor. It varies significantly. Now, people will tell you, well, I talked to Mrs. Merkel, I talked to so-and-so, and they told me over a highball that you know, they would actually support us if we do it. That's all well and good, but it's very interesting that they're telling you uh, this in private when they may be slightly inebriated. I mean, if they, <laughs> if they really are serious, then they should do it uh, openly and publicly. So I think that uh, it's not going to split the alliance, but I don't think this is an issue on which we in the European CIA could be bludgeon them into submission, possibly. Is that good for alliance politics? Not really. The pro side on this economic question. Uh, regarding Europeans and U.S. weapons sales, uh, the Poles, the Baltic states, Canada are all ready and wa waiting to provide weapons if the United States makes the decision. Uh, this is very clear. And maybe a few others. Yes, and, and Sandy <laughs> reminds me some others as well. Uh, it's also true and I would not disparage it the way Raj does, that uh, senior people in Europe and countries that are formally opposed to sending weapons to Ukraine have said to us privately that they are in favor of this, uh, and not when they were drunk or even high. <laughs> uh, but more importantly is what Chancellor Merkel, and certainly Germany has been the principal player in Europe on this crisis, has said publicly when she came here to see President Obama in um, January, I believe it was, of 2015. And she said publicly then, and there have been similar statements since, that yes, Germany opposes providing weapons to Ukraine, but if the United States were to proceed to provide weapons, Germany would continue to work with the United States on this issue. Now, I, I was a diplomat for 31 years. I learned to spot amber lights <laughs> long, long time ago, and this was one flashing amber light. So this is not an issue which will divide us in Europe in any serious way. And on sanctions, Raj is right that Mr. Putin thought sanctions would not hold. I can tell you on the basis of many, many conversations and a lot of analysis that if we were to provide weapons, some countries in Europe would fuss it would not have ultimately an impact on the policy, and it would not have an impact, or put another way, it would not change European sanctions policy. Those, that policy is firm. Six months ago or seven months ago, before all the elections in Europe, 
uh, maybe it was possible to think about sanctions easing. But after the Dutch election, after the French election, and what I think will be Chancellor Merkel's big victory on Sunday, this is not a question. Ambassador Verschbrough. Yeah, just briefly, uh, first I would say if there was a big strategic mis mistake by Putin, it was annexing Crimea. Uh, <laughs> not only in terms of how he overturned the international system, but also he, I think it made it almost inevitable that these sanctions would be much more uh, long-lasting than if he had turned it into a Transnistria or an Abkhazia. Uh, but, uh, but it also now makes it much harder to get out. Uh, but I do agree that uh, he is interested in getting out of the sanctions, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's, I, I'm not convinced that the most likely uh, effect of uh, arming the Ukrainians uh, to a greater degree than we're doing already now would be this escalation. I think that uh, he knows that if uh, he tries to take more territory or really you know, inflicts much larger casualties on the Ukrainians, uh, it will lead to more sanctions. Uh, he can see what happened with the uh, Senate, san Senate and House sanctions bill. And I think he would kind of re re-solidify uh, the European consensus uh, as well. So uh, since the economy is suffering maybe more from other factors, the declining energy prices, uh, Putin's persistent refusal to carry out any reforms, uh, which have then been further exacerbated by the sanctions, uh, uh, he has less, less uh, freedom of maneuver. Uh, even to afford this massive military buildup is going to become more and more difficult uh, as time passes and as Russia's hard currency reserves decline. So, uh, uh, but I do think, as John said, that uh, this issue is not going to be as divisive among allies mm -hmm. as some predict. <coughs> and uh, there's some countries that are, I think, lining up to provide some additional equipment. Some are already engaged in training on the ground with us, uh, Canadians, the Brits, and a few others. So uh, this is not going to be a, 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 a big problem inside NATO. One additional intervention. The, uh, just very quickly. I don't run in the exalted circles that John does. Chancellor Merkel has said nothing to me on this issue. <laughs> but uh, you have a long weekend coming up. I'm sure you're lacking for things to do. Do a LexisNexis search or a Google search and read the statements about arming Ukraine. And, ask, and, and really ask yourself, whatever your position is on, on this may be, is there a great deal of enthusiasm among the European public and European leaders for this? Well, the Baltics and Poland, yes, geography kind of tells you why. I think it's a foolish thing for them to do, but that's, that's, the, that's, their, that's, their, right, uh, that's their right to do. Uh, on, on the San I, I will agree with Sandy on one thing. I think in a, in a net sense, the handling of Ukraine has been a loss for Russia in the sense that it has permanently alienated and pushed to the West the country which is the most important of all the ex-Soviet states. So I'm not here to argue that Mr. Putin is a grand strategist or what he did here or there is correct. I'm simply saying, given the situation on the ground, what ought we to do? And I think some of the things that are being suggested here, if I may, are counterproductive and perhaps indeed reckless. On the covert, non-covert, that's a distinction without a difference, it seems to me, because the, the effect, of Mr. effect on Mr. Putin will not be whether his feelings are hurt. It'll be what the situation on the ground is and are the weapons making a difference. He'll decide based on that. I'd be remiss if I didn't give the other side a chance to respond mm -hmm. to that. Well, I, I agree with most of what you said, except for the last part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Even the part and of course, Michael. the idea that this is going to have some instantaneous effect, I think also, uh, you're right, that he, they will look at what happens on the ground. And we're not talking about uh, giving uh, Poroshenko and the Ukrainian armed forces the wherewithal to fight to military victory. Uh, I did check, and you were right in quoting Poroshenko's uh, speech at West Point. It was not uh, what I would recommend as the right formulation to talk about liberating the Donbass. But I think what, what we've heard from him in recent days, we heard I was at the, the YES conference, and actually we had a side meeting with him, uh, that he is focusing everything on this peacekeeping idea, trying to get to a place where you could actually see Minsk implemented rather than become uh, the, the cover for a permanent frozen conflict. Unfortunately, Putin may be precisely doing that, uh, proposing his peacekeeping force because he wants to cut his losses a little bit by basically freezing the conflict, putting a peacekeeping force along the line of context where it becomes an international border, uh, seeing whether that gets him out from under the sanctions. I don't think it will. Uh, I think. Uh, the principles that are at stake here with the you know, changing of borders by force and waging undeclared wars against your neighbors is not supposed to be comme il faut in the 21st century. And uh, I think uh, 
if the U.S. stays firm and uh, we have Angela Merkel still calling the tune in, in Europe next, starting next week, uh, Europe will stay firm as well. We've got just enough time for one very short last question. Nadia McConnell, please. Nadia McConnell, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. I can't recall which gentleman uh, tried to use Strobe Talbot as uh, part of their def uh, defending their position against. <laughs> okay. I would just um, refer you to an article written by former Secretary of State George Shultz and former Defense Secretary Perry, who clearly states that we have an obligation under the Budapest Memorandum to provide weapons for Ukraine and that it is in our interest in terms of how we deal with Russia as well. I'll be happy to send it to you if you'd like. Any responses? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> an appeal to authority is not an argument. You know, d with all due respect, I don't, I don't care what they've said. Read the Budapest Memorandum. Any reading of it, I think, puts uh, to rest the proposition that it requires us to arm Ukraine. Again, your weekend assignment. Read the Budapest Memorandum and see if anyone in his right mind would really make the argument that we are obligated not just to defend Ukraine but provide Ukraine with arms? I mean, to say that the Russians violated the agreement is one thing, but to say that there's anything in the text that requires us to arm Ukraine is just preposterous. And, and uh, I will make an argument from authority. Our, our ambassadors have told us that there's no actual legal obligation. It's merely a moral obligation in their view. Ambassadors? <laughs> no, that's, uh, I said it earlier. I, it, it is more a moral obligation. It's definitely not a legal obligation. Uh, but I think it takes on added urgency in light of the flagrancy of uh, the way the Russians have violated it, and so many other principles uh, that they themselves signed up for. In some cases, they helped draft you know, the Helsinki Final Act, uh, and now they're the biggest lawbreakers in the world. And we have to uh, take that as our starting point in considering this issue. It's also the geopolitically smart thing to do. But there's one, one, one more point I'd like to make, uh, which is not an answer to Nadia's question. Uh, Raj and Will said multiple times, this is good, you know, they are, are not in any way defending Mr. Putin's policies. Uh, and that's, that's true. So the debate has been about uh, American policy. But I'd like to make something clear, because this, this is at times lost as people look at the work that, that we've been doing here at the Atlantic Council on, on the war in Ukraine, and more broadly on both Russia and Ukraine. Our position is in no sense anti-Russian. It is anti-revisionism, it's anti-aggression. The greatest Russian historian was Vasily Kluchevsky, who wrote sometime in the late 19th century, and this is a, a very simplified paraphrase, that when the Russian state marches, the Russian people lose. And there's certainly a connection between Mr. Putin's revisionism and aggression abroad and his repression at home. And our policies, which are designed to thwart that aggression abroad, will hasten the day, and this is not talking about in any sense regime change, it hast will hasten the day when we see the right developments domestically in Russia. Yeah, on that, if I may, um, I mean, I think part of our argument also is that if we want to see liberalizing changes within Russia, the worst thing we could do would be to try to stimulate a rally around the flag effect within Russia. I mean, Putin could use American uh, deeper engagement as a way to stimulate his own uh, uh, power and, uh, and respect. Um, this is a very traditional thing. It's uh, as, as old as politics. And why hand them him this uh, opportunity? So I can see all the, that you really want to respond, and we can go back and forth. But we are running out of time. And we have enough time for a, a, a three-minute closing statement, oh. three or four-minute closing statement from both sides. Um, and so we'll, of course, begin with the con side, as that's how we started this entire debate. Uh, so you just began with some interesting remarks about what this might mean for Russia. Um, so if we could, we could hear first from the con side, we'll conclude uh, with closing statements from the pro side, and then we will adjourn. Yeah, so I'll just reiterate what I said with my opening, that I think that it's, this isn't necessary for our safety, and American foreign policy actions should be laser-like focused on that. Uh, it could be counterproductive. So Again, we should have humility about our ability to predict the future. That's a basic <laughs> worldview that I think all realists share. Uh, and that, uh, but we think that this could lead to escalation, which would be detrimental to all parties involved. 
Uh, and then in, in terms of kind of trying to look forward here a little bit, um, you know, one thing I think that we probably don't think enough about is what's the, the general context for the American debate. And, mm -hmm. and I find the context for the American debate about Russia to be uh, very one much uh, detached from reality. And again, trying to see the world as it is. I mean, the United States spends 10 times what Russia does on its military force. Europe's GDP alone, leaving aside the United States, swamps Russia completely. Um, European military spending is robust. And even if the United States wasn't part of this at all, Europe is, is a strong, rich area that could easily deter Russia. So I think that there's so much of this, so much more is made out of this. Now, that's not to say that there aren't challenges. There aren't problems. It's not a defense of Putin. But again, there's a context in which we have to be careful about uh, assuming that this is the Cold War again. And that's the frame of reference for a lot of people in the United States, particularly people that are uh, more senior in their career and hearken back to that lesson, right? And there's a lot of good work in political science, science our tribe, uh, that talks about the kind of analogies people use about their experiences uh, that are formative. And unfortunately, I think there are too many formative experiences that harken back to that Soviet time. And everything is viewed through that prism. Um, and unfortunately for, for Russia, if they're, you know, uh, but fortunately for us, Russia just isn't the same animal anymore. And neither is Europe. This is not 1945 when Europe has been devastated. Europe is, is a, a robust economy, powerful country. And in fact, I'd like to see Europe take more of the burden for their own defense. And if Europe thought that this was such a fundamental issue of international life and of their own security, why aren't the Europeans stepping up to the plate in the way that people here in the United States would, even though our interests are clearly less engaged? Uh, so I'll end with that. Dr. Manon, any additional statements for the cons? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say this. You know, we, we live in a country where we can have a spirited public debate with senior diplomats and hash out issues and before a thoughtful audience. And I'd like, the Atlantic Council, I'd like to thank the Atlantic Council again for that. There are places where you couldn't do this. We can do this. That's a good thing. And thank you, John, and thank you, Sandy. I will just say that the, the, the argument that we can run NATO cost effectively by doing what John and Sandy are suggesting strikes me as very curious logic. I don't want NATO to be run cost effectively. I want the Europeans to do what they've promised to do for a long time. The defense of Europe is more important to Europe than us. It is bizarre to me that a continent that if you take as GDP roughly equals ours cannot find the wherewithal to defend itself. We're now wringing our hands saying, how will we defend the Baltic? How will we defend Poland? Shouldn't this have been thought about before you extended NATO to the Russian borders? And now you're, everyone's wringing their hands and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, starting a war in Ukraine is not the way to run NATO cost effectively. It is to take care of the problems that beset NATO. I was against NATO expansion from the get-go. But having done it, it seems to me, we're obliged to make it work internally rather than using the Budapest Memorandum or Donbass as a reason to say, well, that's the way to fix the alliance. That strikes me as very perverse logic. My thanks uh, to the con side for their closing statements. Gentlemen on the pro side, about two minutes each. Okay, well, first let me reciprocate the thanks. This has been an interesting experience and it is good that we can have a civil discussion about these issues and these, there's no kind of open and shut case on this issue, it's been, been a controversial one for several years. On NATO, of course, NATO needs to do a lot to, in, to strengthen its defenses and the Europeans have to do more and, and we're making progress on that, but there's a long way to go. Uh, but part of NATO's declared strategy is uh, to support and help, pr help strengthen the defense capacity of its of neighbors, the countries in between NATO and Russia, because we see it as in our interest that uh, projecting stability and preventing uh, kind of a zone of, of uh, conflict and chaos persisting in the heart of Europe is part of NATO's strategy. And uh, NATO doesn't do the lethal weapons, but does defense reforms and other forms of training. So uh, this, this is something where the Europeans actually do have skin in the game and it's important. But I think just to say a couple last words, I think our we, we diverge on, uh, on our, our advice on this issue, I think fundamentally because we disagree on what's at stake. Uh, I think 
John and I think a lot more is at stake in terms of the international system and how it operates and whether there are going to be rules or no rules. Uh, but also in practical terms, if Russia succeeds in subjugating Ukraine, is really successful in blocking its path to the West, uh, this is a, is a recipe for new conflicts, uh, both in Europe but between the United States and Russia down the road, more color revolutions. Uh, and ultimately, it would guarantee a poisonous relationship between the United States and Russia for a long time to come, which I don't think is in either side's interest. But it's going to be hard to get out of the, the downward spiral we're in in U.S.-Russian relations if we can't find a way to solve the conflict in eastern Ukraine, and ultimately Crimea. But first and foremost, the, the, the ongoing shooting war that Russia is, is maintaining in, uh, in the Donbass. So I still am convinced, as I've said now multiple times, that arming the Ukrainians broadening the kind of assistance that we've been giving in recent years could, the, could create the negotiating leverage to get to a solution. And uh, I think we're likely to go down that route anyway, uh, uh, despite the results of this debate, or whatever you think of the results of this debate. But uh, uh, we, we shall see. The diplomatic opening may be a way forward, uh, but we may have to see a little bit more uh, the kind of negotiating from a position of strength before we get to a negotiated outcome. Ambassador Herbst, your final comments. Okay, thank you. It's interesting, the, in this closing section, uh, a new issue has emerged in very clear light, and that is um, whether or not Europe is or should be able to defend itself. And there's no question that Europe has the wealth and has the ability to spend on defense in order to defend itself. But here, I think, and this I'll appall my our friends on the right one last time, by saying this, I think in this case, um, we're the realists and they're the idealists. Let me explain. Uh, Europe has had unprecedented peace, again, since the end of World War II because of the transatlantic institutions that were built in the late 1940s. You know, in the famous statement, NATO was built to keep the Germans down, the Russians out, and the Americans in. And frankly, that formula has worked beautifully. And while in theory, maybe we should dispense with it, I think we're playing Russian roulette, sorry for the image, uh, if we do it. So let's stick with the formula that's worked, even as we obviously have to adjust it for the new world we're in. And I'd like to thank uh, Raj and Will for a very civil debate. And we could probably do this again on some other issue. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> and I hope we certainly do. Um, before we adjourn, we started this with a poll to see how many of you had made up your mind. I'd like to see how many of you have changed your mind, if any. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> right. uh -huh, one. <laughs> certainly. Please join me in thanking our panelists, the Atlantic Council, and the Charles Cook Institute.